Well, that's kind of a sobering song. The last song, I was thinking about it after we sang it in the first service, and I thought to myself, I better not sing it in the second service. I don't know as I love the Lord endlessly. I love myself endlessly, but I can't say that I love the Lord endlessly. In fact, the idea of loving something endlessly, in my mind, only applies to God who loves us endlessly. These songs are just too deep, I guess. Well, good morning. It's great to see you here in the house of the Lord. Isn't it fantastic to have like zero humidity? I mean, just seriously, that is just fantastic. I just am thrilled with, you know, it could be, I'm okay with zero degrees anymore. As long as there's no humidity, I'm fine with it. I really really am. We are in 2 Corinthians this morning. If you uh, have need of a Bible, there are Bibles in the back. You're welcome to pick one up. I uh, would love for you to follow along here as uh, we have the opportunity this morning to deal with a couple of things that are very practical in their nature. I love the practical application of Scripture, and this morning's passage is intensely practical. In fact, it's something that probably sets on uh, most of our minds most of the time. And so I believe it's relative for us to stop and, and think of this and think of living as a whole in light of eternity. I'm going to ask you please to stand again, if you'd forgive me for asking that. But we're going to read God's word together, starting in chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. And I would like to read down through chapter 5 and verse 5. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose hearts. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. It's far beyond all comparison. And while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, for the things which are not seen are eternal. And Paul says, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands that's eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Let's pray. Shall we, God, we just would ask very simply, Lord, that you'd bless the word of God to our hearts. Lord, help the practicality of this passage to speak to every single one of us here. May we leave challenged, may we leave encouraged, and may you be glorified by all that's said and done here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Paul starts off, and last week we talked about it at length. We talked about the reality that our outer man, our outer body is decaying. And Paul said, even though my body is decaying, my spirit is being renewed day by day. All of us look at our lives and we recognize the mortality of life. And we realize the brevity of life at times. Well, we're coming up. It'll be January 1st before we know it. Not trying to rush things. But have you ever looked at those lists of celebrities that have passed away in the previous year on January 1st? You ever go online, you look at that, and you say, oh, wow, I didn't realize they died. I didn't realize they died. Well, I'm jumping the gun. It's 2017. And I thought, you know, we, we need to look at certain things that are, are noteworthy, certain things that are important. And Paul obviously has this future uh, aspect, and it is very significant. Why? Because we're going to pass away. Fats Domino. Do you remember Fats Domino? Only if you're old as me. I'm sorry, I just pushed the wrong button. So we'll go back, see what happens. <laughs> I'm new to this clicker thing. I don't know. Okay. Try that again. Here we go. Maybe. All of these people have passed away. Some of them are old in our eyes, others are not.
The amazing thing is, oh, Jerry Lewis. Batman. Dunna, nunna, nunna, nunna. Monty Hall, let's make a deal. So all these people that were just noted there, and there's been many more celebrities, have all had the same thing happen to them. They've all passed away. Their outer body was decaying, and it came to a point in their life where they stopped living. For the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is looking at this from the Christian's perspective, and he wants to give to us something that we should be encouraged by. And he wants to prepare in our hearts and minds something that builds confidence. And I think that that's a, an enormous part of this. There is reason to be a confident person with regard to our future with God. Notice here in this passage, in verse 1, Paul writes, he says, We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. He's speaking here not about your actual home, your actual residence. There's, there's nothing going on there. But what he's talking about here is our physical body, and he likens it to a tent. Now, a tent, by its very nature, is temporary, is it not? It's temporal. It's not meant to be the place where you're going to live every single day unless you're a Bedouin. If you're a Bedouin, you've got a black tent out in the middle of the desert, and there's a satellite dish, if you're lucky, that's next to it, right? I mean, that's, that's what we saw. So antennas on the Bedouin tents. But it's still something that you can pick up and move. And what Paul is saying is that our earthly tent, our human body, which is currently our dwelling place, he said when it's torn down, when it dies, when this body finally breathes its last, he says, we have something to be encouraged by. And that something is another body, and it's a depiction here. We have a building, he says, from God. And this is not a house that's made with hands. All of us that live in houses realize that our houses, as well built as they may be, will eventually be torn down given enough time. Because that's what happens with these earthly buildings. I understand the United States isn't that old. You walk into houses that are built in the 1800s. You say, Kevin, they're still standing. I get that. But eventually they're going to rot. Eventually this place is going to fall in. Eventually it will be demolished. But we, he says, we have something that's very unique, and this is a house from God, something that is eternal and not temporal. Now, Paul says this. He says, for indeed, in this house we groan. This present tent that we're in is, is groaning uh, because we're longing to be clothed uh, with our dwelling from heaven. This is the desire of our hearts. In truth, he says, as a follower of Christ, he's looking forward to something that is far better. The earthly bodies that we have are decaying. They're going away, hopefully slowly. This is a result of the fall when God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat of that fruit, because if you do, you'll surely, surely die. And the consequence is now that here we are in these earthly bodies, and these earthly bodies, because of sin, are decaying. And so we're going to need something else, because our inner man, our spirit, as it were, is eternal and will live on for eternity. And so I have a problem, and my problem is my body is decaying. And we spend a lot of time dealing with decaying bodies, don't we? We spend a lot of time. And I, I just had a, one of those big birthdays, you know, 60 years old here a couple weeks ago. And uh, I'm finding out that my body is decaying. I never thought this would happen to me, but you know how that is. <laughs> I, I went to the eye doctor. He looked at me. He said, oh, I got, yeah, you got a problem with your eyes. Your eyes are decaying. And I thought, great, great, you know. I mean, these things only happen to people that are much older. I just never thought it would happen to me. You know what I mean? 
We, we go to the doctors now, and the doctors, you know, I mean, they take so much blood because they test for so much stuff. I mean, they might as well have it all at that point. I mean, they just keep going and going and going and going. Then you got to get a transfusion after you're done. And then they look at something, and they well, you know, that might be out of whack. You need an MRI. You get an MRI, a whatever. I mean, all these different eyes. And, and they, they look at you, and they say, well, no, you're fine. Um, but you're not fine. You're, you're still, we're all still decaying. And the problem for us is what is going to happen? And so today, there's, a, there's always been a fixation about our flesh. What's going to happen? What's, what is the outcome? And we tend to focus on these things. Chapter 4 and verse 14 says that God will raise up his children looking forward to a future resurrection. In Re- uh, Philippians, actually, chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, uh, who, being God, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. You see, Paul is going to point out that we have something to look forward to, actually. And he says that while we're in this tent, we're groaning, we're putting on a a burden, but we don't want to be unclothed. We want uh, truly, as we groan, uh, we're longing to be clothed, in verse 2 he says, with our dwelling from heaven. Uh, So this body is groaning, and Paul is looking at the future, and Paul's looking at the future from the standpoint of, this is something really positive, this is something really exciting, and I'm waiting to be done here with this body so that my future, my glorified body, my presence with the Lord will be made manifest. And so Paul sees himself as groaning under the weight of this sinful body that is decaying. And he's looking forward to something that's very positive. I don't think this message is spoken about enough. Because do you realize as a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Christ, that your best events are yet future? I mean, the most exciting things that are ever going to happen in your life are yet ahead. They're not here and now. This is a transitory spot that we find ourselves in. And there is so much to look forward to. We find that he's very confident. Paul is writing, he says, we know that we have an earthly tent and this is going to to, to go down, but we have also the knowledge that we have a building from God. A house that's not made with hands, one that is eternal. And think of the glorified state of the Lord Jesus Christ and think about the the magnitude of the glorified body that we will receive and it is something of great excitement. Now take your Bibles if you would and just flip back a couple of pages is all to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50 is a common passage that's used in funerals. People, this is oftentimes read. And Paul is saying, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so I have a problem. Because the only thing I know is flesh and blood. Right? My body, my, I'm inside of this. You know, you, you, you all see it. And, and that's a problem. Because I want to inherit eternal life. I want to be with God in the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? The problem is, this physical body cannot possibly live forever. Even if God said, okay, Kevin, I'm, I'm not going to give you a glorified body, but I'm just going to call you up here to heaven. I'd be like, oh, is there oxygen there? Uh, I could have a problem, right? Uh, here you are, you're in heaven. And oh, by the way, you're 60, you're going to die in 10 years. Well, where's the benefit of that? You see, here's what Paul says. He says, behold, I'm going to tell you a mystery. And the question then is, how does this perishable inherit imperishable? And he says this. He says, here's the mystery. Uh, we will not all sleep or die. That's a euphemism for death. But we will all be changed. I believe the reason he says that we won't all die is because some at the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will go into the presence of the Lord and will not face physical death. And instead, as we go up to be with the Lord, we'll be given a glorified body. And that's a great way to go. And I have my name on that short list. (laughs) If it doesn't happen, God says, you're going to come out of the ground and you're going to precede those who are alive, who won't face that death. 
But here's the key point. Paul is saying we may not all die. Most of us will. But he says we all have to be changed. You can't live in this physical body in the presence of the Lord in the kingdom of heaven for eternity. Something has to give. And so he says that the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, he says, and when they're raised, they're raised imperishable. They're not raised with mortality. Uh, They're raised and they're immortal. And we will be, he says, changed. For this perishable must, there's not, an, there's not a, any wiggle room in this, this must, this perishable body must put on that which is imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Does that make sense? You see, you and I have got to have this transition take place if we want all the benefits of living with the Lord in heaven. And I want those benefits, don't you? You see, the most exciting things that are going to happen in our eternity and in our lives are yet ahead. And you and I should be optimistic. It is a wonderful thing that God has prepared for us a glorified body. It's fair to say, woohoo! This is great. I think the devil wants us just to focus on here and now. And not that which is eternal. I want you to see something here in verse 5, back in 2 Corinthians. And if you, if you write notes in your Bible, if you uh, highlight whatever, highlight verse 5. God says, now he, that being a reference to God, you see it capitalized in your Bible. He who prepared us for this very purpose, this transition. This change from an earthly tent to that which is imperishable. The one who has prepared us for this purpose is none other than God. God has been prepping for that very important day when you and I receive a glorified body. Isn't it great to know that God wasn't just like taken by surprise? Oh, what am I going to do with these bodies, you know? Um, hmm, this is, this is a problem. It, 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 it's not that at all. God says this is always, since the plan of redemption, part of the answer to man's problem. So as we age, we're getting to that point where this is becoming more and more a reality for us. And we recognize that God, who's in control of all of this, has prepared for this to take place. And that is pretty exciting. He says that God not only has prepared for this and prepared us for this purpose, but he says he has given to us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is, as a pledge. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that we have the Holy Spirit of God in our lives At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. Isn't that fantastic? And we are sealed unto the day of redemption. When I look at the future, part of the reason I can be so confident is due to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God is bearing fruit and confirming this reality. So much so that what Paul will go on to say is therefore, in verse 6, being always of good courage and knowing, he says, knowing that while we were at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. There is no question you cannot see what we're talking about right now today, can you? Can't see it. Paul says it's not a problem, we walk by faith. He says, we're totally confident. We're not losing hope. Our spirit is being renewed every day because we are seeing the interaction of God in our hearts as men and women, boys and girls who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so my faith is real. Your faith is real. You're you're bearing fruit. You're seeing God at work in your life. And it leads you to a point where you say, you know, my life with Christ is so dynamic and so authentic that it really produces in me a great confidence, and I'm so totally confident in what God is going to do for me today that I can be confident in what he's going to do tomorrow. There's no question about it. I know God is at work, and he has prepared this. He's planned it all out. 
And so we walk or live out our lives, Paul says, by faith and not by sight. Christian, you and I are to be encouraged. You and I should be excited about what God is doing. Uh, we should be thrilled that God has, has a plan for all of us. We should be thrilled as followers of Christ that there's, there's really not a reason to fret about our physical condition. It is an inevitability that for me to be where I want to be, I'm going to have to change. And he's speaking here about the physical change in our bodies. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? Oh, no, no, I, I'm not okay with that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Paul says, I'm at peace. I'm confident. And I'm walking by faith. I'm living by the faith because I know that God has it all under control. And so you and I can have that type of confidence. Now, I'm going to shake it up a little bit here as we look at verse 10. And I'm going to introduce to you the fact that there is something, though, that we need to be concerned about. There's something that we should be concerned about, and it is referenced here in verse 10. In verse 10, it just simply says this. It says, and it's not simple, I guess, but it says that we should, uh, without a doubt, come to a point uh, where we recognize that there is a future, and he describes it here, the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear, verse 10, before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so there's a reward that is yet future that is coming. Now, Paul is saying here that we, and he uses that pronoun, he is speaking here, and it's very important that we get this very, very clear. He is saying we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and when he uses the word we, he's speaking here about believers, that is, followers of Christ. He's speaking here to the church. What he is not saying is that this applies to humans everywhere, that is, believers and non-believers, who will somehow come before God and have all of their works evaluated, and then if there's enough good works, they'll go to heaven, and bad works, they'll go to hell. That is not at all what he's saying. There is two judgments in the Scripture. There's a great white throne judgment. It's at the end of the book of Revelation. And these are resurrected, and they're... Names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, and those who are judged at that judgment, uh, that is the second death, and, and hell awaits. The judgment seat of Christ is speaking here of the Bema seat. There's a couple different words you could use for judge. But the Bema seat was a place where the judge would actually walk up some stairs, and he would be at a higher level, and he could look out, and he could see the games that were going on. And it is his prerogative then to be able to crown the winner and give the winner of that game or that event a reward. Now what God has in mind here is, is fascinating as you look at this passage of scripture. We must all, he says, appear. And the word appear uh, really has a great deal to do with being revealed and sometimes it's translated that way uh, we're going to be revealed and all the things that we he says have done will be judged and they will come under the scrutiny of the lord and we will uh, be judged now he's saying here uh, that this is important to note that there is a distinction between those things that are done in the body whether he has uh, done those things good or bad the new american standard translates it good or bad the word bad is not the word for evil it's not speaking of those things which are morally good versus those things that are morally evil he's saying here that there are some things and when he uses that word bad it's a different bad than you would use for evil and he says that these are things that are worthless these are the things that we've done in our, our bodies that are just without merit and they are worthless. They will not stand the scrutiny of the testing. And there is going to be a test, he says, of those things which we as followers of Christ have done. And we're speaking specifically of things that are done after 
we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. These are things that are done afterwards. And he says those things which are done afterwards are going to be evaluated. How did you use your life? And these things are going to be piled up. And the picture here is, is one of a fire. And that's why 1 Corinthians 3 says, Now if any man builds on the foundation gold and silver and precious stones, those are all good things, right? And he says that there's also the wood, hay, and the straw. Each man's work, he says, will become evident. It's going to be revealed. So when you look at it, what do you think burns better? Wood, hay, or straw, or the gold, silver, and the precious stones? Well, we know that the wood, hay, and the straw is going to go up in flames, and it's going to go up in flames quite quickly. Uh, all of the things that are left will be those things which are not subject to burning up. And so the illustration, is this a literal fire? Probably not, but it's a great illustration when God analyzes all of our deeds and he's able to say, here are some things that are done that have eternal value and here are many things that are done that are frankly worthless. Some of us are going to have some pretty big fires. When I was in Bible college, I was... I was spray painting in a manufacturing plant. And I would spray, um, I don't see any of them here. Uh, they were fire extinguisher boxes. See, now they just hang them on the wall. But you remember when they used to put the glass in them and you had to break the glass? I never really saw the point of that. I guess it kept kids from fooling around with them, maybe something like that. Well, I spray painted those boxes every night. I spray painted those boxes. And uh, at the end of the week, it was my job to take all of the filters. And they were about one foot and a half by a foot and a half. There were about 30 filters. And I had to pull the filters out put them on a car, and take them out to the dumpster. Well, one night I'm out there, and the dumpster was kind of full, and I got thinking to myself, huh, I wonder if these things burn. This is paint, okay? Dried, crusty paint from the entire week. So I thought, well, you know, most things in life need an accelerant. You know what I'm saying? So I got this five-gallon bucket of who knows what, and I dumped it in there on top of all of these things that I mashed down into this dumpster. It, it was 10 o'clock at night, and it was far away from the building, so don't think I was irresponsible. I, I'm just kind of irresponsible. And, and so I took a match, and I tossed it into the dumpster. I had no idea what was going to happen. But I knew enough to toss it and run. <laughs> so when I tossed it, Literally, the flames went 100 feet in the air. It was whoosh. It was the coolest thing. You should have been there. It was, it was awesome. I mean, it went up. Whoosh. And, and, and we were right along Route 35W um, on the highway. And, and a state policeman or somebody of authority saw it. And they th thought it was like the apocalypse or something. So... And I was just thinking, hmm, where can I get more of that stuff to put in there? You know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, this is, you know, feed the fire. It's, it's just amazing. Um, so the police rolled in and the fire trucks rolled in. And the other guys at work, they were still welding and carrying on. They had no idea. And, and it, it eventually calmed down pretty quickly, actually, in this dumpster. Um, the dumpster was never quite the same. Most of the paint was gone. But, but it was great. And I thought to myself, wow, that was really cool. You know, and consumed all that stuff. Now, it's really important for us to think about this. This passage of Scripture, this verse in verse 10. You and I have done a lot of different things. Some of the things that we've done have eternal weight to them. And other things are going to be consumed. I always look at this passage as this is a passage that deals with our heavenly rewards. There is no judgment for sin here. Let's make that very clear. Our sins are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? What we're talking about is those things which are done in our bodies that were done to the glory of the Lord versus those things which were done to and for ourselves. Our motivation is going to be in question. Things we did for the right reasons, things we did for the wrong reasons. 
I have maybe preached messages for the wrong reason. Maybe I've had meetings for the wrong reason. Maybe my motivations, they're all going to be tested by fire. Even those things which we might think are good. It will all be, he says, revealed. It will be revealed. I don't know is this, going, is this is going to be revealed to anyone else be, besides ourselves and God. Probably just the two of us. And we will receive those rewards that are done, those things that are done for Christ in this life. I don't know about you, but laying up treasures in heaven is an excellent, excellent value. It's a great investment, isn't it? Stop and think about it. I mean, as you get older, you look at your life and go, so what if I live another 10, 20 years what am I going to do with that? This is an opportunity to invest yourself with a pure motive as love for the Lord. And we're going to see that next Sunday. Uh, our love for the Lord as being that prime motivating factor. If we do those things that are honorable and we do it for the glory of the Lord, how wonderful that truly is. Amen? And the rewards will last throughout all of eternity. Whereas the things that are done now will be consumed. Paul writes and he tells us that this is something of, of great importance for us to consider. John writes in John, 2 John in verse 8, and he says that when you stop to consider rewards, we need to stop and consider uh, those things that are done and not only consider those things that are done, but consider finishing well because he says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished that you may receive a full reward. Isn't it terrible that you could actually be serving the Lord and then at the end of your life or at some point do something that causes you to lose those rewards? That's a huge point, isn't it? I wonder what it'll be like when we're in heaven. I wonder what it'll be like. Let me give you three key points here as we conclude. And then share one more scripture with you. One of the things that needs to be a point of action for us is to stop fretting over our physical body and making that the center of our life. We need to be focused on the eternal, amen? The reality is what the reality is. But let's make the most that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of all, we need to stop and we need to think, Let's remember that God has this figured out from the beginning. He has prepared all of this. This is not a surprise. We have total confidence because our God is in charge. That is awesome. And then we want to recognize that we need to begin to focus on a life that's well lived. That's a life that's, that's preparing for that moment when we do stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and our works are judged. So after the smoke clears, there's something there. There's something left behind that will last for all of eternity. I'll let me just challenge us all to stop and think, how are we using our life? Are you using your life with a view towards eternity or are you consuming the time that you have here on yourself? Understand this, everything that you're doing you're to do to the honor and glory of the Lord. Don't interpret this as saying, well, Pastor Kevin doesn't think golf, you should do golf anymore. Everything that we do has and should have a purpose with a view towards pleasing the Lord and bringing him glory. You don't have to quit your hobbies. You can use them for the glory of the Lord. All of these things that we do, we need to have God in the forefront of our hearts and mind and how excellent it will be when we get to heaven revelation chapter 4 says and when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne on him who lives uh, forever and ever he says the 24 elders will fall down before him and i believe the 24 elders here represent the church of christ that is now in heaven and it says uh, will fall down before him the one who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And we will ultimately cast our crowns before the throne. Saying, worthy are you, 
our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Let's pray. You may be here this morning and God speaking to your heart today. God speaking to your heart about where you're going to spend your eternity. This is a great text to remind us that we are mortal, that our body is perishable, and that we need a Savior because we all must be changed. Are you ready for that day? Are you at peace in your heart, knowing that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with Christ. If there's a question in your heart and mind, would you stop to consider placing your faith in Christ today? So that you can say, I know that I'm on my way to heaven, not because of something good that I've done. There's no great, huge scale up in the heavens that's going to weigh my good and the bad, but I know that I'm on my way to heaven because I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And my friends, that is the only reason any of us will ever gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. It is because of what Christ has done for us. As I asked in the first service, maybe you're here this morning, God speaking to your heart, and you're convicted over how you're living your life. And I honestly believe all of us should be convicted. We all need to think this through. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God is speaking to my heart today. I want to use my life for Christ. I want to make sure that the things that I'm doing have eternal value. Would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's working on my heart today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to place my faith in Christ. I I need to answer that question of where I'm going to spend my eternity. If God's at work in your heart, maybe you're here and you say, I'm ready. I want to put my faith in Christ. Would you just slip up your hand too? Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for working in our hearts today. I pray for these, Lord, who've asked for prayer I pray for those who who are saying, help me, Lord, to just be able to do those things that are eternal in value versus doing a lot of things for myself. Work in their hearts, Lord. Work in all of our hearts, I pray. Lord, for these who've asked for prayer, who, Lord, want to have assurance that they're on their way to heaven, Lord, we're reminded that you tell us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, I pray for these who've asked for prayer this morning. May you just work tremendously in their heart. May they come to that point where they're willing to say, Lord, I can't save myself. I know my works aren't good enough. And by faith, I'm choosing Jesus Christ. I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ because I acknowledge that as Jesus said, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except it be through through me, Jesus said, I'm choosing to believe that. My friends, if you'll do that, the Bible is true. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Work in hearts today, I pray, O Lord. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.